Can we start recording in a moment? Yes, very good. Yep. All right. This is being recorded. So, so, so just keep in mind, this is being recorded. So if you have, have any sensitive questions, do ask them after we stop recording. Uh, otherwise, feel free to ask questions if they're general uh, during the actual recording. <clears throat> Want to share your screen? Yeah, let me share the screen. Oops, uh, share screen. Can you see that? Yep, got it. Yep, all good. It's the, uh, you can see it still, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. All right, so um, good evening, everyone. Um, today we're gonna to be talking about the pitfalls and challenges in employment law for healthcare practices, um, and even a little bit touching on the hospitals and the larger organizations. Um, with that said, uh, let me give you a brief background about who I am and what I do and what we all do. Um, my name is Ben Mirza. I am mean, actually an attorney, a former CPA, a former uh, certified healthcare compliance officer. I've worked in the field of healthcare for quite some time. I've negotiated a ton of contracts, litigated a ton of cases, and, uh, and, my, and I collect degrees like people collect cars and paintings. And one of my favorite degrees that I got in my very, very, very late and, 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 and young, uh, late age is a degree from Yale. So that was kind of cool. Uh, it was a bonus for me because uh, I've, you know, mostly gone to like, you know, normal sort of schools, nothing, nothing crazy. But that was to me a pretty neat dream. So I got that. Um, so, so I was able to check that off the list. Um, and uh, I've been in the actual healthcare industry for, for uh, a good number of years. I've worked inside large health systems as well as, uh, as the medium sized ones. And, uh, we, and in the last uh, few years, Ed and I have gone off and we've, we've started our own practice where, um, where we do work for organizations from the outside. Uh, with that said, let me introduce you to Ed because Ed is really like asking for Ed, uh, having Ed on this is like having like somebody like, like the guy who's like who's who of healthcare law join you in a seminar. So Ed, Thank you, you. want to talk a little that's, bit about that's very That's very kind, uh, Ben. Yeah, you know, I'm Ed Meyer. Um, I, I've been practicing healthcare law for uh, over 30 years now, uh, representing a, a basically a full array of healthcare providers, be it from uh, Large health systems, nonprofit health systems, uh, to for-profit systems, individual hospitals, to national medical groups. I was with Mednex um, as of a couple of years ago, uh, and uh, also individual physicians and individual licensees, all in the healthcare regulatory area. Um, uh, and uh, I'm just be clear, I'm, I'm I'm a California licensed attorney. I'm not licensed in Florida, so um, Ben deals with it. Florida specific matters. I assist on on federal federal law issues. I've seen a lot. I've done a lot of different things over the years. Seen a lot of different things. So very um, different. Uh, I mean, there are very few things I haven't really seen occur. So I'm just glad to have the opportunity to bring this uh, forward to everyone. So um, starting off with this topic, you know, the couple of things that we try to do is try to make these uh, presentations as academic as possible. Just like I'd started off, before we get started, just, just for actual disclosure purposes, this presentation is intended for general information and, you know, and educational purposes. It is not legal advice. This uh, seminar is open and live and being recorded at this time, and it will be available afterwards as a resource for you to, to go to or to send other people to if you, if you need to. Um, with that said, let's, uh, let, let's talk about a couple of scenarios to kind of set up the stage as to what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, number one, let's kind of start and talk a little bit about, about we're going to talk about restrictive covenants. Um, you know, restrictive covenants are an integral part of our industry. Um, you know, um, Ed and I are pretty well versed in those. Um, even recently, we actually engaged in a, in a fairly large size lawsuit uh, having to do with enforcement of restrictive covenants. And uh, there were a lot of lessons learned for both sides, frankly. And, uh, you know, the one thing that you have to be careful of is how, um, how uh, 
uh, how hard you're going to enforce restrictive, how you're going to structure restrictive covenants, and how hard you're going to go after them. Ed, anything else you'd want to add to this scenario? Well, yeah, yeah. Just uh, also understood covenants, keep in mind, and we'll talk about this later, is um, a restricted covenant, because a non-compete is a restraint is a restraint on, on business, right, on trade. And there are federal antitrust laws that um, are uh, you know, prohibit uh, restraints on trade unless they say they're ancillary to a pro-competitive um, uh, result. And what we're seeing recent, more recently is uh, the Biden administration directive to the federal agencies to look very, very carefully at uh, restrictive covenants. And in fact, there was a case out in uh, just a, 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 a contract dispute involving a restrictive covenant in, in Nevada, uh, where a physician had been terminated. Uh, I think it was an anesthesiologist who had been terminated and they started up a competing practice and then his employer went after him on, uh, you know, in trying to enforce a restrictive covenant. He uh, went to, to state court to um, try to enforce, uh, to try to throw out the restrictive covenant and the federal antitrust folks uh, sent in was kind of like an amicus bleep, a brief, a, a statement of interest in the case, basically providing guidance to the court on how to interpret um, non-competes uh, from the federal antitrust laws uh, that really was, you know, people knew there was out there, but it was really interesting to see the federal government going in and saying, hey, you know, some of these non-competes that uh, they have to keep in mind that, especially in the physician area, that physicians and their employing practices are competitors, potential competitors with each other. And when two competitors get together and say, we're going to divide up the market, which is sort of what a non-compete does, um, that can raise antitrust concerns. So the, the court did that, and that's a case called um, a Beck versus Pickert Medical Group. And uh, the, the federal government, this guidance is not the law there. I mean, it's not, not a decision uh, by the federal government or by the court, but it's the federal government kind of giving its, its, its uh, guidance on it. But so you're seeing more activity. You're going to see much and much more in that area. Um, and, and, and actually, by way of example, just to give you an, uh, uh, an example regarding bonus payouts, um, you know, uh, Ed and I were recently involved in a, in a situation where a physician was to, was to get paid out a bonus based on their productivity and the revenues that were generated. And in that particular scenario, um, you know, when we started digging through, the whole, through these reports, what we found was that, they were, that the billing team was, was using uh, NPI numbers interchangeably in between physicians and so forth. So the report wasn't entirely correct. And uh, so in that bonus payout scenario, when we started to do the calculation based on the NPI number, you know, we weren't getting accurate figures. And uh, so not only was the physician, you know, a bit upset, but also uh, on the other side, the billing was being done improperly under the wrong NPI number. And that has issues in terms of regulatory stuff, right? So it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't comply with regulatory muster. So you have to be, really be careful as to how things are being recorded and built. So yeah. that's another scenario for that. Now, this landscape is actually pretty unique and it is pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty dangerous at the same time. And that's why you see the sign there with shoots and ladders on the other side with snakes and ladders where you know, there's an opportunity to make a lot of money, but then there's also opportunities to violate a lot of law. And when you, when you combine the two, it brings in, if you take a look at bullet point number four, sorry, number two, non-physician owners. And these non-physician owners that have no license in the game, uh, you know, uh, when they get involved uh, and, they, you know, and they start policy setting, um, you know, it, it, it leads to more and more issues that can arise. And so you really have to be careful, you know, everything in the sector is licensed based from the physicians to the facilities, to the equipment, like even your x-ray machines, they have licenses and permits related to that, right? So yeah. everything is recorded. People are, 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 are or agencies are monitoring these, these practices. So this is a really, really heavily guarded uh, very, uh, you know, precarious sort of an industry 
that again has the ability to make money, but also the ability to cost a lot of money. Yeah. So, like from again, we're talking about employment law. So, you know, what, what point we're trying to make is that you have general employment law, you know, wage and hour law, Fair Labor Standards Act, um, you know, you know, Family Leave Act, um, and other the other issues that deal with employer employee relationships. And we're going to be talking about this in the seminar. But also laying over that, you have a very complex set of regulations because you're dealing with um, licensed persons. You're dealing with, we talk about non-physician owners, you might have situations where non-physicians may not have the actual ownership, but they have a, have a um, you know, like they manage it. And so there's kind of a de facto or control type issues um, of which some of these, uh, let's say, private equity companies may not fully understand the regulated nature of healthcare and then how that might imply implicate issues dealing with employment. So it's just important to understand that you have those two areas. You have the general employment law and then you have the complexity of healthcare overlaying the employment issues. And it, yeah, it's kind of a layer. And now the other thing is actually uh, item number four where it says uh, regular attestations. Believe it or not, every time you fill out a HICFA form and you submit a claim, there's a whole attestation that that implies, not, not implies, it actually explicitly states it, whether you read it or not is different, but there is an attestation where you're basically saying that you are submitting uh, this particular line item um, uh, after complying with all of the, the codes and statutes and regulations and, and everything is in proper order and compliance. So that can actually come back at you. So today we're going to start off a little bit differently. We're going to start off with with uh, with with the shoots, meaning the snake side of it, right? The whistleblower lawsuits and how those come about, and what employers need to do to actually look out for that, and the lay of the land and how that works, because that's got a lot of ramifications to it. And we're gonna we only have three slides on it, but I think it's important to 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 touch on it. Then we're going to talk a little bit about drug testing. We're going to talk about the Fair Labor Standards Act. And then last but not least, the non-competes and restrictive covenants, which is really near and dear to our hearts because that's where I think all the fun is at. Uh, uh, so let's get started. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to uh, healthcare, uh, employment law is unique. And employment law is unique because of primarily these three statutes that you see, the False Claims Act, the anti-kickback statute and the Stark law. And that all impacts uh, uh, employment law and how, uh, 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 sorry, employment and how people are recruited, how they're treated and what happens when they actually depart from your company. It's a very different way of treating employees. Whereas in other industries, you don't have to look out for those statutes, right? So in our healthcare industry, you've got to be very, very careful. So let me give you an example. So, so you know, again, we're not going to really get into the details of what the False Claims Act is other than, you know, you can't file false claims, you can't falsely. But under the False Claims Act, if your employees have the ability, if they find out the employer is is falsifying claims, um, filing or reckless acting in reckless disregard or deliberate ignorance of the rules on filing a claim, they can file a whistleblower lawsuit. And as there's a financial incentive for them to file those lawsuits and, and claim between maybe 15 and receive up to 15 to 25 percent of the recovery of a, of a false claims act. And, you know, these claims are between twelve thousand five thirty five and twenty five thousand dollars per claim file. So if something's repetitive, done falsely, there's add up very, very quickly. And the employee has the ability to uh, you know, file a lawsuit. On behalf of the federal government and have that get a percentage again similarly under the, under the federal anti-kickback statute that deals with inducements to get referrals and that's by the you know employer to get referrals it's an in, intent-based statute but your employees might you know at some place be involved in providing uh inducements maybe you know, they're getting incentivized to uh, you know, bring in more money for the practice, and they might be dealing with a kickback situation. So it's really important that your employee, your, your employees, understand what the rules are. There's monitoring because of, of the employees because the employees could take actions that are then go to the employer and uh, can implicate these. This is a criminal statute. Stark law, the 
The Star Claw is a bright line test on uh, anti referral, uh, and unless they, the uh, arrangement um, is fits with squarely between fits squarely within a, an exception, and there are especially when dealing with employment of physicians, there are specific Stark Law rules on how an employment and their compensation has to be structured under the Stark Law. Um, I guess Ben can talk later about his rules. That state, each state has its own set of rules too. So well, we're saying this primarily because this is a key part of what we want you to, to pick up from this session is that employers cannot prohibit an employee from disclosing or reporting illegal activity. So that means that there's a threat, threat out there and how you treat your employees will affect what happens. So, you know, uh, actually uh, uh, employers uh, are, are prohibited. Uh, uh, it, the employee can actually go about reporting the activities or the, or, the, or, the, or the presumed illegal activities, as long as it's in good faith to the EEOC, to the, Sec to the Securities and Exchange Commission, the National Labor Relations Board, the Department of Labor and CMS. And there's, there's a whole bunch of other agencies that may apply, including federal, state and local governments. So just know that there's a lot of letters monitoring what happens in healthcare. Yeah. And to give you an example, in the Security Exchange Commission, you know, sometimes there'll be, a, let's say, a, a wage and hour, like a, a just employment law dispute, and the parties get into a settlement agreement. And if it's a publicly traded company, you know, there oftentimes these settlement agreements you want to keep confidential. But if if it deals with reporting Security Exchange Commission violations. You cannot have a, a, a prohibition in that settlement agreement that prohibits the employee from, you know, telling the SEC that the employer was doing something illegal. So all those those uh, settlement agreements need to be very, very carefully designed so as not to um, implicate or to violate um, the non the, the prohibition uh, for, uh, on um, causing employees not to disclose or report illegal activities. So it's important to remember that. All right, so this is our last slide regarding on this topic. Um, what, empl uh, what employers cannot do is they cannot demote, they cannot cut someone's pay, and they cannot dismiss them from blowing the whistle, for, for blowing the whistle. Not only is there federal statutes uh, uh, that are considered the Whistleblower Protection Act, but there's also Florida statute. And Florida actually has two statutes. One is for private whistleblowers, uh, uh, meaning private employers and their whistleblowers within them. And then there is also public whistleblower act. So the, if you wanna find out more, um, go to our website. And we've got like actually a whistleblower page on stuff at, on our website. So it, it, I mean, if there is an investigation going on in your place of work, you know, I mean, just make sure that the employee who the employer is thinking might have caused all that, you got to just leave them alone and you got to let the governmental investigation play itself out uh, and not to interfere with that employee, because otherwise it means even more stuff that's going to come at you. Um, so just just be careful of that. Now let's step into into the drug testing realm and um, and, and where we are. So, can a healthcare practice uh, implement drug testing policies? The answer is, of course, yes. And keep in mind, it may be required by law. Now, employees who carry firearms, yeah, they have to be drug tested. I mean, it just makes sense, right? You know, employees that are involved in transportation who may be carrying passengers or patients for that matter. You know how there's buses that are carrying uh, patients and delivering them to different locations or, or you know, for, for example, EMT even, right? So those sorts of transportation employees, they need to get also, also drug tested. Um, the employees who are involved in, in, in drug rehabilitation uh, uh, employers, they need to get tested as well. So there's actually a lot of different industries that go through this, but it's it's a it's a you know drug drug testing in healthcare is uh, is often normal and it and at times critical. Yeah, and you know keep in mind that you know any practice or hospital are going to have controlled substances oftentimes in in the in in their facilities or in their clinic locations, and physician practices may have contracts with hospitals to provide coverage. 
uh, and that hospital is in that coverage agreement is going to require uh, the ability to have drug testing done. So you really want to be laying out in your employment uh, manual employment arrangement how the, the, the uh, drug testing is to be done. Also, I want to mention um, this is sort of a practice pointer. Uh, it's also important if you're if you're an HR professional and uh, you're dealing with you know your your drug testing policy and you have a drug testing policy in place. Um, I would suggest you also get online to look at uh, how one can circumvent drug testing. Because um, if you, when you know how they can prevent it, how they can circumvent it, and you person has goes in to be drug tested, you can look for the evidence of activity where they're trying to get around it. I remember one case where I had several years ago where I had a, um, dealt with a, a, an employee uh, that had tested negative three times and the fourth time they tested positive. So we kind of go, what happened? Why is it so? And they were a long time you know, user. And it turned out like they were doing little things like uh, when they get in to go get, get drug tested, they you know, have to give a urine sample. They were saying like, I can't go to the bathroom. I can't go to the bathroom. I can't go to the bathroom. And, and then all of a sudden the person at the drug testing lab walks in in front of them. So I'd use the urinal <clears throat> and the guy goes, oh, I, I got to go now. I can't get in the bathroom. They urinate themselves. Like, oh, I got to go home now. We'll do the drug testing tomorrow. And the HR professionals, oh, I guess that's okay. You know, but you know, when they're going home and doing something to clean themselves out. So um, perhaps, allegedly, I would just say. Um, but so just you'll know, be mindful of those sort of things. And no, I'm also, also, bottom line, too, I want to make sure that people do know that, you know, it because of the stresses in the healthcare industry and the availability of, of, of controlled substances, there are folks who become addicted. And those folks really should, if they're thinking, if they're in this industry, there are their professional licensing organizations will oftentimes have programs to self-report and get oneself cleaned up. And if you do that under the licensing rules, you have to check those out. You you can get kind of get a pass uh, on it as long as it's happened before you're 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 found out, right? So um, just just you know you have to deal now, with that. Now, conversely speaking, if 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 a, if a person gets reported for that, right? Uh, and it is found out, meaning that they report to 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 uh, to the Department of Health, and it gets found out that they are a drug user and so forth. And it can have like pretty significant ramifications on their license. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and the one of the ethics uh, ethical rules that the physicians have to follow is that they have to have to report what they see going wrong in the practice, right? So that's kind of like one of their ethical requirements uh, a lot of times you you turn you know you look the other way turn a blind eye but um, that is a part of the requirement and I have known physicians to report each other um, w without the other one knowing so anyway uh, with that said you know you can and test people for drugs if, if they're a job applicant if there's a fitness of duty that requires testing uh, if we, if uh, they happen to happen to have gone through a rehabilitation program, um, and also you can do it as a part of random testing. Or if there's suspicious things that the person is doing, and you've got got reasonable suspicion that they should be drug tested, so those are reasons that you can. But you know, under Florida law, you, as an employer, you're not required to do drug testing. <clears throat> So how do you go about establishing and implementing a drug testing policy? Well, number one, keep in mind, it's got to be written and done in advance, at least 60 days in advance before it goes into effect. So everybody who knows or should know 60 days before it actually goes into effect that, hey, this is going to be coming on uh, 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 as a mandatory, uh, you know, uh, no drug abuse sort of a policy, right? So if you do that in the policy, what you have to have is you've got to have um, basically, uh, you know, the company's uh, drug use policy, its testing requirements. You got to have like the ability to, to for a, a employee to notify confidentially the prescription drugs that they may be taking, and then you've got to keep those uh, that information obviously quiet and confidential within the HR files. 
the other thing you want to keep in mind is that uh, you know that that, that if a, if a, if a person refuses to take a drug test, you've got to mention it in the policy as to what can happen to them. So this is all a part of implementing that policy. But remember, it starts off 60 days in advance. It's got to be abundantly clear as to what it is and what are the repercussions of it should the should the employee fail. <clears throat> Now, the other thing is make sure that the policy is posted in a conspicuous location in the workplace. When it comes to medical marijuana, Florida is a bit of a in the gray area. And, and, and actually, Charles is a, one of those authorities on medical marijuana, probably better, better than most people in the, in the state itself. <clears throat> Florida is a big gray on this. Florida... Uh, Florida has made use, uh, medical use marijuana legal. However, the federal law has it, right? So Florida is pretty stays quiet when it comes to requiring employers to 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 enforce uh, uh, you know um, no marijuana sort of places. Uh, it's really up to the employer. And the employers really, it depends on them if they are in a federal program or not, meaning like federal funding, uh, if they have to abide by federal laws. So like, for example, if you're a part of the government and you're in Florida and you get federal funds, uh, if you're working at the space, Kennedy Space Center or something like that, you're obviously not going to have employees that, uh, that, 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 that use medical marijuana, at least not that I know of. Um, uh, you know, similarly, uh, the opposite also applies. If you're a private employer and medical use of medical marijuana doesn't affect you, you don't get any federal funds. Uh, as a Florida employer, you may just, you know, let it go and not really worry about it. Charles, any thoughts on this? No, the, the, only, the only thing I would say is that if you do have a policy of it, and as long as you're recognizing it before we go to adult or recreational use in the state of Florida, which is a Couple of three years away, but if it's if it's all medical, then they should have a valid medical marijuana card. What looks just like a driver's license, uh, but that's something you should have and ask for if you put that policy in effect. Uh, this way, uh, you, they they do legally have the right to use it in the state of Florida without the medical marijuana card. It's still very illegal. Right, right. And of course, if someone is treating a patient, um, don't treat under the influence. <laughs> right, right. You know, and it also can cover rights. It's, it's like you, you have these uh, the hospital coverage agreements, and uh -huh. the hospital may then go say, hey, I want to have someone uh, tested. Right. So um, uh, you've got to just to be, make sure that uh, there's you have that card beforehand and obviously weren't using during. During a if, if, they're allow, if they're allowing you, because if they're not allowing you and you test positive and you don't have the right. card, then they may just yeah, you got a problem. They, Huge they, problem. They have a problem. But if you have the card, that is, uh, as one might say, you get out of jail card. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, all right. So now we're going to talk about the the, um, the the Fair Labor Standards Act, and uh, today we're going to focus a little bit about um, the uniqueness of the healthcare industry as it relates to interns. You know, uh, in the healthcare industry, there are a lot of interns, especially in the state of Florida. And I and this and this law really varies from state to state. But in uh, in Florida, the requirements are really this, and we've made them into like seven bullet points. That there's got to be clear a clear no expectation of compensation during the internship. You know, um, when you you know, so do you have to pay interns? No, you don't. As long as you follow these sorts of policies. Now there are paid for internships too. But they're also non-paid, right? And if you're doing non-paying, you got to follow these. So the internship must be similar to an educational environment, like what you would be given in clinical or um, or a, or a hands-on training environment. Um, there must be a component of formal education that's integrated into the actual the the, the coursework and the training has to be integrated together, that it, one relates to the other. It typically follows the academic calendar year, although I think. It, you know that may be a softer rule because the academic years are starting to change now as we as we as we become more and more flexible regarding education. The internship um, uh, uh, learning has to be tied to a limited period of learning, 
and just not a continuation of work. So it's got to be for a designated time frame, and uh, and it should not displace a regular worker. Um, you know, that's that's bullet point number six. And there should be no expectation of a, of a paid job at the end of the internship. So given all of those things, then I think you can it passes muster and you can have a, a, a not paid for internship program in Florida. In Florida. In Florida. Yeah, because every state's you, different. Hey, yeah. What's your experience in the Got to pay interns <laughs> in California. <laughs> yeah, that's the bottom line, yeah. So every, every state's different. So um, yeah, yes. So make sure you're following the state's, state's rules. But. So, you know, and then also a lot of uh, healthcare places are full of volunteers, right? So uh, when it comes to volunteers, I mean, volunteers are not employees. So you have to just keep in mind that these are the four or five bullet points that really apply to them, that truly the individual is donating their services. They have no desire or they understand that they will not be getting paid, that they understand that they will not be considered employees, that they're really doing it for the public service, religious or humanitarian objectives in mind. Uh, so meaning for the good of the community um, and uh, they're not serving uh, as an employee. So, you know, it's, it's usually done on a part-time basis. If you, have, if you have a full-time volunteer, you know, just be careful of that because, um, you know, it's uh, the volunteering is starting, starts to look more and more like employment. So. Could, I, could I ask a question, uh, Ben? Sure, sure, shoot. Uh, so as far as volunteers are concerned, or the intern, as far as you said, they're, they're not getting paid. What happens if you have benefits, kind of like a free meal? You work for me and I buy you lunch as part of the deal that you're working here. Or some companies provide that. Uh, is there, I mean, I don't know about volunteers at hospitals. Do they get to eat at the cafe half price or employee pricing or whatever? Does that does that give you some kind of anxiety per se? <laughs> yeah, Charles, that's a great question. I've never been asked that. Uh, you know, I would it's agree. pretty common it practice. Yeah, it is pretty common. Now. Yeah. Yeah, I just volunteered uh, out here where I am in Texas um, for uh, like serving alcohol at a big fe festival and I got free lunch. I got free dinner. That was great. You know, See, so, so, so are you a paid, are you a paid employee now? No, I'm not a paid employee. <laughs> um, anyway, no, no, no. just food for thought. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, no, I guess. Yeah. I see what you mean that it could be considered compensation, but uh, you know, I would just think it's just a recognition for being a volunteer. You know? Yeah. Modest meal, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So um, the other question that often comes up in the in the space of healthcare is what is a full working day? You know, um, because people have different shifts. People have some people have long shifts. Some people have overnight shifts. So what is a full working day? Yeah. And it's important to note what's a full working day for purposes of you know wage and hour law, right? For um, for non yeah. non exempt employees. Yeah, and, you know, so 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 the thought is primarily this, and then I guess if you've got a particular scenario, we can run through that. But but the but the but the but the basic rules are, you know, the day begins uh, when the employee engages in work, right? So that's when the clock starts to run until the final compensable act is performed. In you know, the final compensable act, those are those are actually terms of art. Um, <clears throat> note that logging on remotely to a computer to perform a single act is not deemed continuous. If you're only logging on to do a single act, it's not continuous. Um, however, if the person then sits there and continues to work, obviously it is. Now, in, as you might notice in certain places that are larger facilities, like for example, for us attorneys, it's the courthouse. For auto workers, it's their plant. And for certain hospitals who may have like a longer security screening process, right? So like if you walk into the Cleveland Clinic um, uh, you know, there, there may be like a, um, a screen that you have to go through the metal detectors and so forth. So if somebody's waiting in line there, that's not a compensable act. So if an employee is waiting in line to get security screened, it's not a compensable act and it's not an integral or an indispensable activity for the employee. So it's not deemed to be compensable. Keep in mind that, that meals 30 minutes or longer are, uh, are, are generally non-compensable as long as employee is completely relieved of the duty. 
So completely relieved has, uh, are, are again, terms of art. So you have to be completely relieving the individual from doing anything. So meaning you can't just leave the person sitting there watching the phone, even if it doesn't ring for a half an hour, they were still having to watch the phone. So right. that's the, if they're on their lunch break, the employer really shouldn't be calling them up and saying, hey, I have this question. You know, let it sit until the lunch break's over and then then deal with the question. But if you're interrupting their lunch break, then all of a sudden you could potentially have, if you're doing that consistently, you have wage and hour law issue. So um, the other thing is a rest break, right? Most places uh, do allow like a 20 minute, a minute uh, rest break. Uh, and that's usually within like a four hour period. And that's deemed to be working time. If you're doing that, remember it's working time. It's not off time. So, so that's a part of the part of the gig of being an employer. Now, what about sleeping time? Again, this applies to uh, only, only, only very specific situations like firemen and healthcare, <laughs> right? Uh, so, you know, what's going to happen if a person is spending a 24-hour shift on site? Uh, you know, is you know, do they get compensated for the full 24 hours, or is the employer able to deduct eight hours of sleep time um, for such employee? So the way, it, the only way to deduct that eight hours of sleeping time is if this four prong thing is done right. Number one, there has to be a clear understanding that the sleep time is excluded from compensation. Number two that the employee is provided with adequate sleeping facilities and which allows them uninterrupted sleep. So that there has to be a separated sort of an area where the person can actually go, go lay down on a bed. The other thing that's also required is that there has to be an anticipation of at least five hours of continuous sleep that they can get. So, you know, it's gotta be uninterrupted, right? So. So that's all a part of this. It's all in a, uninterrupted. As long if it's if it's uninterrupted, it's uh, it's if it's uninterrupted, it's deemed as sleeping time. Anything else you'd add to that, Ed? No, it's all just uh, be careful about interrupting people during their breaks or during their sleep time. So, yeah. yeah, that's true. Now, when it comes to actual travel time, you know, a lot of times you have uh, employees that are traveling out to like. Uh, patient homes, apartments, and so forth, and and they may even be traveling from one one healthcare facility to another healthcare facility, and and they may even be traveling out of town. So you know, all of that is considered to be working travel time. So if you're going from um, if the, if they're going to a specific patient location, that would be deemed working time. OK, if they are uh, um, or if they're going in between sites, meaning one work site to the other, that's compensated travel time. Uh, if they are traveling for a single day, it, you know, the employee must be compensated to and from for that place of travel. So if they're traveling out for three hours, like let's say from here to New York, then they got to get compensated for those three hours or five hours for that matter, because by the time you get in the car, Go sit, or go sit at an airport, get off, get in another car and get to your location. Probably a whole day's worth of travel has gone by just getting to New York, right? So you got to think about all those things and how much you're going to compensate them. Uh, overnight uh, travel uh, requires that if, when you have a multiple day travel, the employee must be compensated for traveling in be between normal business hours, meaning like eight to five sort of hours. So if they're traveling a full day, like let's say they're going from here to like, you know, um, Korea or China, you're going to pay them, at, if, if it takes them two days, you're going to pay them for two days worth of pay during their travel. So what are the overtime exemption categories, right? So- And can I ask a question before you go forward? From sure, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Have, uh, can you, is there a differentiation between a salaried individual and a per hour individual when it comes yeah, to we're, that's this next set of slides right here. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the, Charles, I'm glad you asked that question and yeah, Ed was all ready for you. Ed. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so, 
so yeah, there's actually an exempt category, and the exempt category has several categories. One is the executive exemption, another one is the administrative exemption, and there's a professional exemption. So like, for example, the professional exemption has in it like people that are typically in like some sort of a, a professionally licensed sort of an environment, right? So like law, medicine, pharmacy, you know, um, RNs, for PAs, uh, you know, that sort of stuff, right? So accountants, they would be, de they would be deemed to have a professional exemption. Now, also keep in mind that someone who earns more than $107,000 um, a year as of January 2020 would also qualify for one of these and qualifies for one of these categories would be deemed exempt. So that's deemed a highly compensated workers exemption. <clears throat> now, on to our, any questions about Fair Labor Standards Act? Okay. Now, on to our favorite topic of non-competes and restrictive yeah. covenants. Ed, you want to? Uh, yeah, yeah. So let me talk. Let's talk about this. Uh, you know, in the healthcare field, you know, commonly with physician contracts and other contracts, you're going to find uh, restrictive covenants and non-competes, and that's oftentimes because um, there are proprietary information of the practice, the secret sauce of the practice and the business that they're trying to protect. Be it you know certain patents, inventions, copyrights, uh, you know, certain software they've developed to deal with how they run the, the practice, you know, patient lists, specific patient lists, vendor lists sometimes, you know, strategic strategy issues, um, how they're, what they, their business planning um, mm -hmm. and their systems and structures. Those are all things that the practice, you know, that creates value within a practice, the practice they're thinking about uh, trying to figure out ways to protect. And um, that's why they will put in, you know, restrictions and non-competes in them, in, in employment contracts. But you have to be very careful that you don't implicate the antitrust laws dealing with restraints of trade. So the next slide, please. Yeah, actually, b before we go on, just to kind of right. kind of mention to you, um, you know, a lot of times in non-competes, I'll see vendor lists are de are deemed to be proprietary, which I always find find kind of odd, and I can understand both in both directions. At times, it, they are there are sacred relationships with certain vendors that are important to the organization, and but at the same time, once the person leaves and they hire the same vendor, you know, it's just kind of an odd thing to have inside inside agreements. Uh, I guess it would really depend on the, on the on the special set of circumstances, but obviously patient lists would be would be would be would be proprietary information. Yeah, that's also interesting. Patient lists are also a very interesting issue because patient lists are, can be very well proprietary, but at the same time, when a physician leaves a practice, according, depending upon the state, they may have a, an obligation to get the list for the sole purpose of notifying the patient that they have moved, and then giving the patient the right to move their medical records over to where they are now, their new right. employment, as opposed to, you know, using it for more broader purpose. So um, you have to be very careful about dealing with patient lists and ensuring you're both, if you're saying you can't get patient lists, you gotta make sure you're looking at your your uh, yeah, medical and, board and licensing on how they're going to be handled. Yeah, Ed, that's a that's a that's a really good point. Florida law does have certain requirements when a physician does leave a practice and moves on to another practice. There is a notification required somewhere in there. I haven't looked at the rule in a long time, yeah. but there are specific rules asked for that. So, so oftentimes when they when they have a the the right to notify or the obligation to notify patients, the practice itself may want to jump in and create that that notification to to protect that that list. So that the obligation of notifying patients is done uh, in a manner that uh, still protects that patient list, uh, but still gives the the right to, to patients to move to to continue being cared for by their particular physician. You know, you, you know, another another case that we were involved in recently was was a full blown Medicare Advantage competitors compete uh, having an all out war where one 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 competitor was saying. Uh, that the other competitor took their employee and along with it went their whole strategy plan, you know, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, maybe there was some truth to it, but I, but, but I really represented the other side of it. I fully believe that 
when you have something like a Medicare Advantage plan, where Medicare Advantage tells you exactly what they want, how you how they want you to take care of your of your of your patients, and the kinds of and the kinds of KPIs, the key performance indicators they want you to manage, I'm not so sure that there's a whole lot of strategy left in that. You know, it's all in the execution of it, right? So it's all in the execution of that strategy. So the better a a a, a place is at executing something, the more they'll the the more effective the implementation of that strategy is. So a lot of times I think the secret sauce lies in the execution and not necessarily in the idea itself. Um, you know, it, it, just recently my daughter even came to me and she goes, "Hey, Dad, you know, I had a fight with my with my friend about it, it was my idea and not her idea." And she said, "No, it was her idea and not my idea." And you know, and and, and, and when you really think about it, there's nothing original on this planet. It's just in the way, yeah. it's, it's just how you use those ideas going forward in your particular situation. The implementation of the idea. You know, ideas, everyone would have, but the actual I mean, way where someone actually accomplishes the idea, we look at actually patents, that's what's pat potentially patentable if it's not otherwise patented by someone else, is that the execution, how to achieve the idea. So if somebody has the idea, hey, it'd be great, you know, as they yeah. said in that movie, uh, you know, what's that movie? Night shift, feed mayonnaise to tuna, right? That's, you know, <laughs> actually how you feed mayonnaise to tuna to create that uh, tuna salad. Uh, is That's a good different. one. That's a, yeah, so, yeah. That's a good one. Um, so what kind of information is not deemed uh, confidential, Ed? Yeah, so, you know, some people say this is confidential, but, you know, what if it's already out there in the public domain, it's not confidential. If it's common in the industry, it's not practicing, it's not confidential. Uh, things that might be publicly already listed are not public confidential. Uh, you know, the government issues metrics, those are not confidential. Um, if, uh, you know, directory uh, physicians uh, uh, that are on the health plans, that's not confidential. It's already out there. You know, you put on your website uh, certain things. That's not confidential anymore. List of offices, uh, list of, if you have on your website, the list of uh, payers that you deal with, that's not confidential. So, uh, you know, someone might say this is confidential, but, you know, you'd be really careful about what actually is. And if you're, because I'm talking a minute about the antitrust laws, if you're trying to overly protect something, the antitrust laws can say this is an unreasonable restraint of trade. So let's go to the next uh, slide and kind of get into this. So you have section one of the Sherman Act. This is a federal law. It's been around since like early 1900s, I think. Um, that says every contract combination, the form of a trust or whatever, in restraint of trade or commerce is declared to be illegal. It's very broad. Um, and it basically, you know, contracts that restrain trade are illegal. Now, if, and, and they're enforced by the Department of Justice as well as the Federal Trade Commission. And, and more recently, we've seen more activities really in the healthcare field to um, seek enforcement of this provision. So for example, there was a case in um, North Carolina dealing with UNC, University of North Carolina, um, uh, Chapel Hill and Duke University, both their medical centers. And they basically say, hey, look, you know, we have, you have your medical staff, we have our medical staff. Let's agree that we're not gonna poach each other's um, physicians. Well, that created a restraint of trade because physicians couldn't leave UNC Chapel Hill and go over to Duke or leave Duke, go over to Chapel Hill. And the Federal Trade Commission looked at that and said, that this, this is a huge problem. Uh, similarly, you're, you're often seeing in, in, in um, hospital coverage agreements that you can't approach uh, the, the, you know, the other's employees. Um, so you have to be very careful how those provisions are drafted. Um, so as not to implicate the antitrust laws. Again, this case I mentioned before about uh, out in Nevada uh, dealt with um, the base of the federal government stepping in and it's directing the court or, or advising the court because it wasn't a, a final decision by the federal government. It was, a, it was their advice saying, look, a physician is a potential competitor with the practice. And when they're coming into the practice, if they're agreeing, Hey, look, you you for zoo practice, you can take care of this area, but if I leave, I can't compete against you, uh, especially you know some of these very long non-competes um, that extend well beyond the expiration of the uh, practice. That that can implicate this 
prohibition on restraining trade. Uh, so uh, the government has been more and more active. It's really important on for anyone in the human resources area in healthcare is to look at this antitrust guidelines for human resource professionals, because that's a great uh, set of guidance issued by the Justice Department and the Federal Trade Commission jointly. Uh, I'll give you the link down here, um, and you can ask us for a copy of the slides to get the link again. And that gives federal guidance on all these issues that might deal with antitrust in the uh, employment law area. So again, I mentioned the Biden administration is becoming more and more active because what they're looking at is the importance of uh, the ability of folks to move from company to company, and that creates greater commerce in, in, under that scenario. Um, and the they have issued a uh, executive order to the Federal Trade Commission, to the Justice Department, uh, to basically look at the antitrust laws and see how they might be restraining the ability and these non-competes, um, the strict ability, restrained ability for people to change jobs. And the federal government has been more and more uh, active in that area, which I think is probably one of the reasons why they issued that uh, statement of interest in the Florida case. Mm -hmm. So I guess it was looking at that, that what they were looking at, what the federal government said in that case was, look, you don't need a non-compete because there's other provisions in the employment contract to protect the interests of the employer, such as the uh, you, know, you know, keeping information confidential, um, the confidentiality requirements, the uh, not stealing, you know, not taking uh, the proprietary information and things like that. So that your, your the employer's interest was already protected, such that there wasn't a need to have a, uh, the government argued, there wasn't a need to have the a long non-compete. So um, what happens when a non-compete uh, restrictive covenants are uh, are violated, right? Uh, obviously, both sides have the ability to sue, right? So there's actually post-employment litigation that often, that not often, it happens on rare occasions, but when it does, it's usually pretty big. And there are several types of claims that can be be brought. If one side files a claim, then the other side counter sues. That's why we're showing you the employer or the employee side, depending on, on the situation, uh, it'll be one or the other that actually brings about a, a lawsuit. So assume in this, in this scenario that the employer is the one who brings the lawsuit and they'll usually bring it, uh, bring it forward to enforce the restrictive covenant or maybe for return of property or maybe to stop the person from working in a particular geography um, at a, at a, with a competitor. Uh, or maybe that they're using the information for an unlawful purpose. Um, you know, it, it, it could even be sometimes I've, I've seen employers uh, sue employees for return of advanced compensation, meaning like if somebody got paid out a bonus that they were owed at the end of 2022, that as of June 20th, let's say that they got paid a partial bonus, but it's not deemed earned till the end of the year. Employers will sometimes sue on that which is not all that nice, but it's, it's, it's been done, I've seen it done. But now conversely speaking, employees can also file counterclaims in that sort of a scenario to maybe recover back pay that they haven't gotten paid, maybe to recover vacation pay, uh, meaning earn vacation that they, that they earned the vacation or paid time off that they never got paid for. You know, if the employee is leaving on bad terms, they may in fact file a lawsuit for harassment, assault, or infliction of emotional distress, and the and the common law causes go on. But the key one to remember here is you can recover from all those, but the key one to remember here is the whistleblower or the key tam lawsuits. You know, um, this is often often uh, uh, deemed to be like retaliatory action. But but it's it's a part of what the employee will have available in their arsenal to go after the employer. If you talk to some of the CEOs in the healthcare sector, some of them will tell you that they do not go after former employees specifically because of the the you know, whistleblower issues. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we just wanted to kind of lay it out there as to how two sides will go after each other. The one unique thing that actually Florida courts do that 
um, is that they have the power to what's called blue pencil the agreement. There, if the agreement is broad, the courts are allowed to blue pencil out the provisions and make it something that's more reasonable and narrow to the situation at hand. So it's a lot of power that's given to the courts. And this blue penciling is really for the benefit of the employer because employers will often you know, have employees sign very broad agreements. And in order to make it reasonable again, they're allowed to blue pencil them. They don't necessarily just, you know, strike them out. They actually blue pencil them. So which means to modify. So that means that you can start a lawsuit. So when the courts look at non-compete agreements and non, you know, enforcement of non-competes, first thing that they look at is, is there a legitimate business interest that is being enforced uh, through the non-compete? Meaning like, are they just like looking for, to, to enforce the, the, the non-compete uh, for example, for information that's already in the public domain, you know, like, why are they doing it, right? So, like, like if somebody started suing for, uh, how, for you carrying a list of office locations or you having a list of providers on one of the health plans, like, let's say, Humana or Blue Cross, well, that information is already public, right? So, there is no legitimate business interest in that sort of a scenario. But when there's secret sauce, then there is legitimate business interest. The courts will also take a look at the geography restrictions. Are they reasonable? They'll look at the, 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 whether the time period of the restriction is reasonable, meaning is it like two years or less is generally deemed reasonable. But once it goes above two years, it starts to look more and more unreasonable. If it hits five years, for sure, it's, I, I mean, I, I think you can pretty much count on it being deemed unreasonable. Again, the blue penciling in Florida will count and the judge will be allowed to lower it to like, let's say, a five-year uh, restriction down to a two-year restriction. Now, when it comes to actual lawsuits and fighting them, you know, they can be costly. They can go, I mean, starting off and there, there's not much of a fight. <clears throat> there's still going to be a lot of back and forth on it, but it can be like five, 10, 15 grand pretty easily. Um, however, if you have a, have a, have a full-blown fight, they'll hit easily over $100,000 for each side because Oftentimes, these, these lawsuits travel very fast. There's usually injunctive relief actions in them, and you've got to pretty much do the whole case within about a three-month period. So it, 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 the lawsuit travels fast. There's multiple attorneys on, on each side, and everybody comes well lawyered up. So it is an expensive proposition. So if, if, if someone does decide to get into a tango, um, well, I think it's, you know, they better pack their pocketbooks as well because they're going to need them. So ultimately, what I've seen happen is um, when these lawsuits are over, neither side is happy, you know, neither the employer nor the employee. Uh, it leaves a bitter taste in everybody's mouth. Um, but that's how they're resolved. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, sometimes people get silly and they go after each other and do this sort of stuff. So with that said, any questions about employment law or whistleblower cases or non-competes? Um, Charles, if you can stop the recording. Yeah, I got, I got one question for you. Can go on the recording before we go. Sure, sure. Uh, when you say recovery of pay, how does an employer prevent an employee on recovery of pay they know nothing about? <laughs> yeah, then I guess that it didn't happen, right? Does it? Does a bear go in the woods, right? So, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, I think I think something's got to got a clue um, the employee that there was pay that was mm -hmm. owed to them. That at least they, they at least that? they made a claim for and didn't get, or they can just kind of say, well, you know, I've worked an hour overtime for the last five years and not and never get never got paid. Yeah, you know, well, that's kind of what happens sometimes. These class action lawsuits. So. <laughs> So uh, where uh, someone figures out that hey, you really should be paying them, and uh, then they go, well, there's a whole class of employees they never paid for, and they aggregate that together, and they go after them with a very large number, and yeah. then seek a settlement. So yeah, could be one of those things you talked about earlier, kind of like the uh, interrupting people while they sleep or something like that, thinking that you're really yeah. not doing anything wrong, and you could have a class action going against you for thinking that they should have gotten paid for that time. So. Yeah, so you have to be very careful to make sure you're right. following all the payment rules. Right. Okay, I'll stop the recording.